Dan Burton, the chairman, is in the chair, and here's our live coverage. Document that appears in your, uh, your book is uh, exhibit number 513. And uh, this is a document that was taken uh, from Charlie Tree by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And the title of the document is uh, Cooperation Opportunities with James Riotti. The, um, the original document, I, I, I just want to get it here real quick, uh, was in uh, Chinese, and it's been translated um, and it, as it appears now in, in uh, Exhibit 513. And I, I, I just want to read it for the benefit of, uh, of the record, although it'll be submitted into the record. It, it, the text that we received as a translation is as follows. Number one, Walmart in Shanghai opens a store. And just the editorial comment is, where haven't they opened a store? But because Lippo has a successful cooperation experience at Lippo Village and receives, received a sweet reward at Shenzhen actively urged Lippo to work with them in opening stores in Shanghai and Beijing. Must obtain retail license and buy local product and imports to sell before we can consider. Local government may join uh, in, but maximum 10%. Walmart takes 10%. Remaining uh, uh, may be divided by you. The needed land must be uh, not less than 10,000 square meters. Hopefully it will be a clear-cut deal. Distance from medium and high income area cannot exceed 20 minutes driving time. Buy a hospital in Shanghai and modernize it. At the Lippo Village already has gained high-level hospital experience, plus James is a trustee of the Arkansas Medical School. His father is a trustee of USC. They may invite foreign doctors to be visiting doctors at Shanghai and can send Shanghai doctors for advanced training in foreign countries. The targets are foreign businessmen and high-income people. Buy a school in Shanghai or work out a joint venture. Uh, for an international school. Lippo Village's international school may be used as a model for planning. Number four, there's a hotel in San Francisco. The stock should be bought in total or in part. This hotel is owned by the bank and is worth $7 million. It has a good record and may get a 60% loan. Suggest that you find six Chinese accounts to invest $1 million each. Lippo will retain one-seventh of the stock. These investors instantly become a partner of Lippo. They can use that to request immigration. LA bank stocks may be a, a part of the LA bank stock can be sold to uh, Wang Jun, uh, knowing you have good relations with Jun, hoping you can be an intermediary. Uh, proposing that Wang Jun buy the Lippo bank stocks with money as reinforcement to enter the US market. You may also plan uh, to get a part of the stocks and director position. James is a fair person. He knows especially the long-term strategy and advantage of using business partners. He knows you have good relations with China. I uh, hope you may be uh, able to realize the above suggestions. He agrees with my proposal and is willing to work with you on the above items. If you are going to Jakarta in October, he may send his helicopter so you can visit Lippo Village. Uh, thus, uh, you may have a clear picture to push for the above items in China. He may wait until you finish meeting on October 9 and hold a detailed talk with John Wong in New York on October the 10th. Uh, the question, first of all, have you ever seen this document before, Mr. Wong? No, sir. E either in its uh, original form or in its translated form? No, sir. At any time, did either Charlie Tree or, or uh, Ng Lap Seng uh, ask you for a business help or introductions? No. Do you know if uh, Charlie Tree ever had uh, a, uh, um, a relationship, a business relationship with the Lippo Group? Not prior to that, no. Prior but to the, the, what? The, appear what you're saying on this, uh, to the memo or whatever, the translation, anything prior to that, this indication looks like they're going to go through some business. Okay. You know. You, you would agree I was with me. not aware of that. You, yeah. you would agree with me that Exhibit three, 513 appears to be uh, a, a, a recitation or, or proposal that there be further discussions for business between Mr. Tree and, and the Lippo Group. That's what it appears to be. That's right. Do you have any independent knowledge that any of the items mentioned there in, in that uh, document 513 uh, actually came to pass or are coming to pass? Uh, and for instance, the first item on the list is a venture with Walmart in Shanghai. Did you ever discuss that with Charlie Tree? I did not dis Congressman, I, I know about, around that period, I know about some of the uh, uh, 
uh, matters like a Walmart situation. For instance, Walmart had the joint venture with Lippo in Jakarta, in Lippo Village. Okay. And, and are you aware that Charlie Tree has anything to do with that? For that uh, Jakarta joint venture between Lippo and uh, Walmart? Right. He might have known about it. He has nothing to. He had nothing to do with it, as far as I know. Do you know? Do you know anything? Let me let me go back to my original broad question. Do you know anything about a business relationship between Charlie Tree, whether it's the items on this memo that we're talking about, uh, and the Lippo Group? More after. The only information I had, I believe. I, uh, Mr. Riotti had a conversation with me, maybe around the period of time, indicating Mr. Charlie Tree visited Mr. James Riotti in Jakarta. Uh, Mr. Charlie Tree is, apparently is looking for business opportunity as well. So it leads to me to believe that's probably props that after that, that kind of meeting. Okay. Uh, let, let me. Uh specifically run through the items on the memo, just, just so we're clear. I, I've understood your answer to the broad question, but let me, I've asked you about Walmart. The second item is modernizing a hospital in Shanghai. Have you ever had a discussion concerning a, this project with either Charlie Tree, James Riotti, or anyone else at Lippo? No, sir. Okay. The third project is a school in Shanghai. Have you ever had a discussion again, Tree, Riotti, or anyone else at Lippo? Before you proceed on this, I don't know if it will be helpful or not. Uh, it was understood Charlie Tree was going over to Asia quite a bit, in particular in China. That was known. Apparently, he had, he had established some contacts over there. Okay. So, so on a broader sense, things in to China, just in case you want to have some, some help or Charlie Tree might be a help, then probably that would be a subject of discussion. So what I was trying to answer is in on specific items, I did not know about it, what you have read. But on a broader basis, maybe he might be helpful about Chinese ventures in the future. That I have heard. Well, again, going back to the, the, when I was, we were talking in the previous 10 minutes about this, the night of the September the 26th, 1996, after the Sheraton Carlton event. Uh, apparently, Mr. Tree and Mr. Riotti knew each other well enough that Mr. Tree was comfortable having Mr. Riotti be a guest in his home on that particular evening. Is that right? At that point, yeah. And, and, and at that point. And, right. and I think that this memo talks about a trip to Jakarta on October the 9th. And, and I, I guess I'm thinking it's October the 9th, 1996, which is 96, yeah. right after, within 10, 12 days after this event at the Sheraton Carlton. Is that a fair observation? That's right. Okay. Uh, the, the fifth one, then, and, and again, I, I'm not trying to, to trip you up. I understood you said you don't have any knowledge of the specifics. But the fifth one project specifically refers to L.A. bank stocks. And it says that it may be uh, a part of the L.A. bank stock can be sold to Wang Jun. Uh, uh, Wang Jun, do you know who he is? I know of this person, but I never met with him in person. What does he do for a living, do you know? Uh, I'm sorry, what, he, what was he do? Do you know what he does for a living? I think he was a chairman of a CITIC, or China International Trust and the Investment Corporation at that time. Uh, do, you, do you know if he has any business dealings that has to do with the, the, the selling of arms, firearms? The, is he in the gun business? Uh, at that time, I did not know. Uh, you know uh, that today? Because the news accounts indicated that, yes. Do you believe the news accounts? I mean, do you think he is an arms dealer, or do you just think that, uh, you know, like that business that Mr. Waxman was talking about, Mr. Solomon, that they made that up about him? Do you have reason to believe he is an arms dealer? Again, I don't know. I never verified that. Yeah. Okay. The, um, do you know, as you look at that paragraph, what, what the paragraph refers to, what bank it's referring to? The bank is Tom uh, Lippo Bank of California. Okay. If he was referring to located located in Los Angeles. Uh, head office at that time was in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. Did did you ever have a discussion uh, concerning this paragraph, the L.A. bank stock and Wang Jun, and uh, with either Charlie Tree, James Riotti, or anyone else um, uh, at the at Lippo? No, sir. Okay. Did did to your knowledge, did Charlie Tree ever visit with James Riotti or the, another member of the Riotti family in Jakarta? As I indicated to you earlier, they had a meeting uh, when Mr. Tree visited Indonesia. And 
do you believe that to have been on October the 9th, 1996? Mm, I don't know exactly. They probably around that period of time, probably. Is it is it fair that it was in 1996? Is, is that your recollection, or you just yes, know? yes. Okay. It did you again? You said that you've never seen this document before. Now, so I assume that the items contained uh, in this document uh, never were the subject of conversations between you, your lawyers, and the Justice Department. Not in a specific sense as. Go ahead. Not in a specific sense as you indicated uh, on this uh, memo. But I believe the Justice Department would like to know uh, at the time that the relationship between the uh, trees and realities. Okay. And, and the last question I have is the yellow light uh, uh, brightens our, our hallway. Phone records indicate that uh, between September the 23rd of 1996 and October the 11th of 1996, Charlie Tree placed calls to James Riotti eight times. Uh, are you familiar with the content of, of any of those telephone calls? And specifically, since I believe that during some of this time you were actually staying at Mr. Tree's home, uh, were you present for uh, uh, any of those telephone calls? No, sir. I was not even aware he was making a call to Indonesia at the time. Okay. Mr. Very Chairman, you'll briefly. I'd be, be happy to, Mr. Uh, did the Department of Justice, when you were being interviewed by them, did they ever ask you about this document? Not specifically about this document. This is a translation of, uh, of that. What, what do you mean, not specifically about this document? Did they ask you about the contents of the document? No, they were interested in knowing about the, uh, the relationship between Riyadi and Tree, uh, Mr. Riyadi and Mr. Tree, or Lippo and Mr. Tree. But Did they ask about Wang Jun at all? I think so. What I knew, you know, who Wang Jing uh, is, you know, what, what was his role as Congressman was raising similar questions today. Mm -hmm. But you didn't have any close dealings with Wang Jing? Definitely. I didn't even, I never met with him. And you didn't know anything more than what you said about the relationship between the Riyadis and Charlie Tree? That is correct. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Shays? Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wong, um, I try to remember that I have a, a, an advantage uh, that you don't. I can ask questions. Uh, you're put in a difficult situation, and I sometimes look back when I've asked questions and regretted the questions because I think I misused the power I have. But I want to ask you some very blunt questions, and I also I'm going to ask you some questions about salary, which I want you to know I would have asked or wanted asked by the committee behind closed doors, but we weren't given that opportunity. So I'm going to ask you some questions that I would have preferred not to have to ask you in public, because they may be important or they may not, and I'm just, in some cases, going to be checking. Uh, but first, um, and I don't mean to keep bringing it up, but it's the point of my question. You pleaded guilty to conspiracy to defraud the United States government uh, for 150000 and then you said there was about 800000 that you were aware of that was basically from the Lippo Group, from the Riottis, or their related companies by employees that ultimately you suspect was paid by the Riottis. I want to know if this was your scheme or their scheme. Mr. Riotti... Well, let me track back. Mr. Riyadi has uh, made the commitment to raise the uh, million dollars. Right. That commitment's made. And he told this to the president that he would get a million dollars to to uh, to the to help raise okay. uh, whatever the give whatever. Okay. The 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 end result is the same anyway. Right. You need to get a million dollars. Right. And then the I was in the United States. I was the point person to put everything in the execution and work with him and get everything facilitated. And you knew this was illegal? Yes. Okay. Um, but was, was it your idea to him that he should do this, or was this his idea to you? Or was it a team effort?
the thought process is coming in joint basis by implement the whole thing. Now, so both of you were involved in this conspiracy to defraud the government and to, to uh, ignore campaign law. Now, frankly, you probably could have done it by a soft money contribution because who knows whether that's illegal um, since it's not called campaign money. But at any rate, you, you, you went this route. It was clearly ir illegal. And I would have said if you did the soft money, it was wrong, but it may not have been illegal. Um, and what, what I want to know is why would I have confidence that you were qualified now to work for commerce, given that you were involved in a very serious scheme of, of close to a million dollars. As I reported to Congressman Waxman's question yesterday, you know, and I would have hoped nobody would have caught up for the longest time, nobody caught up on this matter. So nobody knew about this matter. If anybody knew about this in the process, in, the, in my appointment, probably I would not be qualified. But the challenge, thank you. Uh, the challenge, though, I'm also, the question I'm also asking is, why should I have any confidence that when you uh, basically raised two to five million dollars, that you weren't involved in the same stuff. Why, why did you all of a sudden to be, decide to be honest when you worked for the DNC? Mm -hmm. Congressman, I knew I did, did wrong during that 1992 to 1994 period of time. I tried very best not to do the same thing again. Uh, when this campaign finance matter erupted in 1996, I think the Justice Department has made an extensive investigation, and I, I've been trying to, very hard to cooperate with them completely on that. The, um, the question mark I have for you is you made $60,000 well less than you were qualified in the DNC. And you had a very unique uh, arrangement. You had a bonus arrangement. And the bonus arrangement was based on what? Based on the, uh, hopefully, hopefully based on the performance, how much I can raise. I was, I was leaving that to the DNC, meaning the chairman of the finance committee, to make a decision later on. Can I ask unanimous consent, Mr. Waxman, that I have uh, ten more minutes. Uh, um, could you do five, I, and let's see what happens after that. Uh, I'll need ten, so I'll come back afterwards. Uh, so, Mr. Waxman, did you uh, have some questions? Yeah, I, I, let me take a round of questions. Gentleman's recognized. Mr. Wong, I, I want to ask you about your cooperation with the Department of Justice, and I think this follows after what uh, Mr. Shays was questioning you about. Pr prior to de pleading guilty to campaign finance violation, you had been cooperating with the Justice Department's campaign finance task force. Isn't that correct? That is correct. And according to the Justice Department, the department contacted your attorney in August 1998 about a possible pre-indictment plea agreement. Is that correct? That is correct. And were you willing to talk to them? Yes. Uh, 
In fact, according to the brief filed with the uh, sentencing court by the prosecutors, quote, from the outset of these discussions, Defendant Wong indicated a desire to cooperate with the government's investigation, end quote. They went on to state that, quote, Defendant Wong never adopted a confrontational posture with respect to the negotiations, end quote. Uh, I understand you met with the prosecutors and investigators approximately 20 times between January and April of this year. Is that right? Uh, at least. They probably even started earlier than that, sir. Do you believe that you provided useful information to the Department of Justice? Yes. According to the prosecutor's brief submitted to the sentencing court, I want to quote, the prosecutor said, Defendant Wong was deemed to be credible throughout the proffer sessions. His cooperation was substantial in that it answered many questions which would otherwise remain mysteries and provided incriminating evidence pertinent to numerous ongoing investigations. Moreover, Defendant Wong admitted to wrongful conduct beyond that which the government would otherwise have been able to prove, end quote. Mr. Wong, do you feel badly about your involvement in making illegal conduit contributions? Yes, very much, sir. The Department of Justice had the same opinion. According to the prosecutors, Mr. Wong, quote, always exhibited bona fide remorse for his actions, end quote. Um, I'd like to read for the record what the Justice Department said about your character. Quote, Defendant Wong appears to have lived in an, an upright life. Moreover, his reputation in the community and, and observed behavior have demonstrated to the government that he is generally a self-effacing and kind individual. During the course of the investigation, the government has interviewed numerous credible witnesses who, without exception, speak to Defendant Wong's integrity, end quote. These are not my words because I wouldn't know whether it's to say it or not, but these are the the prosecutors uh, that uh, you talked to for over uh, 20 separate times. Um, today's Thursday. You were in this hearing all day yesterday. I think we started at 1 o'clock. We went till close to 6. We started at 10. It's almost 3. So you've been here, you alone, as the witness for this hearing. And the day before you came here, you had testified in California. What was the uh, The grand jury yeah. in Los Angeles, yes. And how long did that grand jury testimony go? Uh, that started at something like uh, 10 o'clock through 2.30, and I'm going again the next week, I believe. So you go next week again to the grand jury? Right. And you flew a red-eye flight to be here to, to, uh, with us yes uh, not, not last night, but the night before, to be here with us yesterday? Not quite. I arrived at 1 o'clock, as I told chairman and also the committee. Not quite exactly the red eye, but I did arrive like 1 o'clock in the morning, yes. Oh, I see. Well, I was feeling sorry for you because I've taken that red eye, and I know how grueling it can be. I know that uh, flight that gets here at 1 o'clock is also grueling, but not quite as grueling. Congressman, I saw you in the flight before, I used to come here quite a bit as well myself because my home was in Los Angeles. I, 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 well, I apologize. I didn't come over to... To salute to you at that time. The gentleman yield for a second? Sure. What conversations did you have with Mr. Wong on your airplane flights? <laughs> <laughs> I don't recall that I've ever no, I've met I Mr. Wong before today. Uh, I might have met him at some party or other. Maybe out going in or out of a cocktail party. He might have passed on some word about somebody's reputation, but of course I wouldn't have repeated it. Um, I, 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 I just want to put this on the record because, Mr. Shays, you're asking why you should believe him. I don't know if you want to believe him or not. He's, we've see, the only way you can see whether a witness is telling the truth is, is to get all the facts, ask him the questions, look at him, look at his demeanor, and then rely on other people. And this is what the Justice Department has said about him. He certainly did a wrong thing. And it was a serious wrong, seriously wrong thing that he did. It was a felony, uh, uh, amounted to a felony violation. But there are times when even though somebody's done something wrong, that they're not, uh, everything they do can't be assumed to be um, duplicitous or wrongheaded. Thank you. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, let, let me just take a couple of minutes, then I'll yield the balance of my time to you. Uh, at the beginning of our meeting today, um, I read 
some information from the 302s uh, of the president and the vice president. And the Justice Department did not ask any questions of the president or the vice president about John Wong, Charlie Tree, Maria Shaw, Pauline Kinchanlek, or anybody involved in the finance scandal. The Justice Department did find Mr. Wong. Charlie Tree was not fined by the Justice Department, but the judge in the case was so upset, or upset enough, because the Justice Department was just giving Charlie Tree a slap on the wrist, that he himself imposed a $5,000 fine on Mr. Tree. Now, the reason I bring that up is you're using statements from the Justice Department as a reason for us to show credence to the witness and possibly to others. The Justice Department has been totally uncooperative with us for the last three years. They've kept documents from us. We had to subpoena them. Uh, we weren't going to get the 302s from the president and the vice president until I threatened to subpoena. And in fact, I did subpoena the assistant U.S. attorney from the Justice Department, and he was going to have to come over here. And when they found out he was going to have to come over here and tell us why he wouldn't give us the 302s, they finally coughed those things up. So. Uh, uh, I, I just want to point out that the Justice Department has been anything but upfront and cooperative with our investigation for the past three years. And for that reason, and, and regarding Mr. Tree and Mr. Wong, even the judge in the Tree case was concerned about the way they handled that. So uh, I don't think just because people in the Justice Department make some positive comments about any p person, not in particular Mr. Wong, that we should take that as gospel. And with that, I yield to my colleague. Will uh, you Mr. yield to me, uh, Mr. Chairman? No, uh, I, I know what you're going to do. You're going to respond to what I said. Well, but what, what's wrong with giving me a chance to respond? Well, you have. All right, respond. <laughs> I, I just want to point out that the just, I, know, I know that no one can say anything to you in the defense of the Justice Department. Not much. Uh, but I will say this, that the Justice Department was acting at the request of the FBI, because these 302s were the FBI's in, in, uh, interrogations of the different witnesses. And the FBI uh, asked the Justice Department not to make certain things public. And then, again, I talked yesterday about the phases. And phase five is when the White House Justice Department or FBI capitulates, and we usually receive the information. Well, we did receive the information. In fact, you described yesterday how we had to go to, our staffs had to go and look at the President and Vice President's 302s because they wouldn't release it. Well, now that they've released it, we have it. We've agreed to you to your request that we make it public and the people can see what the interview consisted of by the FBI. Not the I don't Justice believe Department. the FBI was the ones that was asking those questions, at least in that one interview. With they the were president? just they were just people from the Justice Department. Well, that, that ought to be on the record, so we'll see what it's in the 302s. We'll see were. what the 302 said. But the only other thing I'd point out is whether it's FBI or anyone else asking the question of the President of the United States, they had two specific issues that they were asking him about. Unlike this committee, I don't think they thought they should go on a long fishing expedition and ask the President of the United States every possible thing that they <laughs> might ask him about. There has been no evidence that the President of the United States ever knew that any of these contributions were illegal, that they were foreign sources. Let me reclaim my time. And so therefore, to pursue those questions with him. Let me reclaim my time and just let me reclaim my time and just say this. You're not going to find out what the president knew or when he knew it unless you ask the questions. They asked absolutely no questions about John Wong, Charlie Tree, Pauline Ken Shanlack, Mark, any of those people when they went over there. And the people that went over there, some of them felt like they were not supposed to ask those questions because they might have a problem. Mr. Shays. Could I renew my request for um, unanimous consent for 10 minutes? Without objection. Thank you. Um, m my question was, given you, that you had done these, I had asked, why should I have faith that you wouldn't continue them? Because you hadn't yet been caught. And you gave me an answer, that you regretted it, and you said you didn't uh, uh, want to do it again. But. Um, I guess the next question is, why should I have any uh, sense of confidence that 
the Riyadis uh, and their organizations would want to function in a way that would be honest. What was what 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 made them want to change it? And that should I assume that they have changed or that they're continuing to be manipulating the system and defrauding and so on? What, why, why should I have any confidence that they are like you have seen the light? Congressman, I, I agree you'll be concerned based on the past records, but at that period of time when I went with the DNC, I didn't have any reason to believe they were going to do, do those things. Hey, now, it's your testimony uh, that you were, when you were at the DNC, uh, you did not have uh, make any effort to raise money from the Riyadis. Is that correct? That is correct. Did you make an effort to raise money from people who worked with the Riyadis had business dealings with the Riyadis. The reason I paused them and trying to think, you know, and uh, to the best of my knowledge, I did not. None of their business partners you didn't raise any money from? Congressman, the, the reason I, I paused a little bit is because there is instances that could draw some data line there. It was uh, the we were denied uh, the contribution. You were what? I'm sorry. Uh, we were denied uh, contribution. You know. Uh, huh? Right. And what about that? Be, be, because the the world did not as, uh, Mrs. World did not as father. Ha Xing Ning okay. was the uh, uh, was a partner with the Lippo. Okay. Now, and your reason for not raising money from the Riyadis was that they no longer had green cards. They no longer worked. In, why, he, why wouldn't he have gone? Mr. Riyadi is already uh, at that point. Already, no I mean, there's no logic why you wouldn't have asked him for contributions. He gave he gave up uh, the green card already. He and did not have the status to, to give any more money. Because he no longer had a green card, that was the reason why you didn't seek to raise money from him. But he still had business associates in the United States. Why wouldn't you raise money from them? Well, the only person, that's why I'm trying to say, the only person he's trying to help me is on the will to Donata, whom he know he wanted, you know, you know, that was the only links we can we control right now. How much money was that? Uh, as I report to you, the the couple made about four hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, and I should have confidence that that was their money. I have no reason to believe that not. They're coming very substantial family. Now, um, should I feel comfortable that in '97 and '98 uh, you received eighteen thousand from the Riyadis, and '97 and '98 you received twenty thousand? Why should I feel comfortable about that? <sighs> Despite the fact that all these things happen, you know, the Riyadi family, I worked for the Riyadi family for a period of time. Right. There's still some friendship there. And, uh, you know, I, I was def definitely, is it a, functionally, I was not employable. I'm pretty sure as a friend or any friend of, of any person probably feel concerned about the financial situation. I guess, guess at that time they were trying to help me out on that. I, uh, and I understand they were trying to help you out, Mr. Wong, and this is a difficult kind of question to raise, but it's not unlike trying to help Mr. Hubble out. You are a key witness 
Uh, and, and now we have to determine whether uh, your vulnerability financially doesn't put you at risk. Mr. Chase, in the event what you're suggesting is going to play any role, I, I probably would not implicate the reality family. As I reported to you and all, whatever they've done in the past, you know, that was involving, you know, eight hundred some thousand dollars in the past. And I was, uh, you know, cooperating fully with the Justice Department. See, the challenge that we have, and uh, it is really part of the public record, and that is that um, the Riyadis uh, have dealings in China, mm -hmm. and it is an inevitable, frankly, when you have dealings with the Chinese, that you are going to be dealing with the military and their intelligence community. That's a reality. And um, for me to make a claim uh, like the Senate report does, uh, that they had these contacts, is, is, is really almost a non-statement. You're not going to have that kind of dealing unless you have that kind of communication with the businesses that are run by the military and the businesses that are run by the intelligence community, which gets us into this next question. And that is, why would you, what did you do uh, for um, the Commerce Department? What was your responsibility there? The title is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Interna International Economic Policy. Actually, my role at the end was, uh, when I joined in, was assistant, assisting uh, Assistant Secretary Chuck Meisner. The primary role of my functions mostly will be a, on the organization side. Uh, did not have any territorial functions. As the IEP, the International Economic Policy was, say somebody's in charge of Japan, somebody in charge of the Asia Pacific, some people in charge of the uh, Middle East uh, or Europe, I did not have those kind of role. Then why would you have been, uh, why did you need top security uh, clearance? The best I can answer that is Mr. Meisner and I went in commerce late. In fact, Mr. Meisner went in even earlier than I am. The historically functions and duty were taken away from him. I'm pretty sure he was trying to make every effort to reclaim his responsibility back. So you, ha you had top security clearance, and you were provided information on a weekly basis, on a daily basis? And what kind of information would you have generally been provided, not the specifics, but? The, the most of the information given to me is not on the as you say, the daily basis, there's some material coming in. There will be a security briefing by the, I believe the CIA's persons stationed in the Commerce Department on the more regular basis. Uh, in a lot of cases, this was raw data, correct? This, this was not, this was pretty raw data that you were given, very sensitive data. It also gives you sources of where this information came from. Mr. Shays, I will be very honest with you. I don't know how to define what is raw data, is not raw data. I never worked in the in the yeah. government before. Yeah. The, but you were provided not only information as to uh, economic um, secrets, but also uh, potential sources for this uh, information. Is that not correct? I, I think you're correct on that. Yeah. And I'm still not clear why you needed that information. That was given to me by, by Mr. Meisner. Yeah, but why? I, I can't answer that for, for Mr. Meisner on that. Thank you. No. Uh, as I understand it, it didn't take you long to get your security clearance. Uh, in, in other words, I was told the process was speeded up. How long from the time 
you went to the Department of Commerce until you uh, until you got your security clearance? I did not know for sure, Mr. Chairman, at that time. But the news accounts indicating that I even got that in January that year, or the end of January or early February that year, and in 1994, that? before I went to work for a Commerce Department. I did not even request for. No, no, no. Before you went to work for the Commerce Department, you had security clearance? According to the news account, I did not know. You don't know when? I don't know for sure, yeah. Well, I just want you to know that uh, for us to get security clearance for our staff, sometimes it takes three, four, five, six months, and they do a very thorough FBI and background check. Do you, to your knowledge, did they do any kind of background check or FBI check on you? Again, I. I have to say, I never worked in the government before. I, they did ask me to fill out all kind of form. I would assume they're going to check all my data. You know, there's very thick forms I had to fill it out. But, but to your knowledge, you had your security clearance before you even went over to Commerce. I did not know that part. But, but from what you've heard, and we'll check on that, you had your security clearance when you went to Commerce. No, I, I didn't know I have some clearance on that because if somebody had to check my background. I thought that was. That was that was all it about. Uh -huh. Did they? Did anybody ever interview you at the FBI or anybody else about your background or your connections or whether you beat your wife or anything? I don't beat my wife, by the way. I know you yeah. don't beat your wife, but what I'm saying is, did, did anybody ever interview you about anything regarding security issues from the FBI? No, 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 not from FBI, no. And you got a security clearance. That's something we're going to have to look into. Uh, Mr. Souter. I have, I have a uh, new category of questions that I'd like to um, discuss. And I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Natural Resources Committee, a relatively new member. And I would like to ask you a few questions about the Riottis and their coal interests. Coal? Coal interests, OK. Um, could you explain a little bit of what your understanding is of what the Riyadis uh, own in Indonesia related to the coal industry? That was a long, long before the way I understand. I didn't even know whether he really had any substantial interest in coal. I think they have some coal mines way early back into late 70s or early 60s. I know for a fact probably they don't own any coal mine at the time on, on, on this issue was, uh, you know, uh, occurred. Do you know anything about the P.T. Katadin Mining Company? Yes, there was a company under Lippo Group in early stage. That was, I think that might be related to the coal mine, the coal mine interest they, they, they own. You say it was at the early stages of Lippo, and in, to your knowledge, that wasn't functioning during this period, or is that was the... My best guess is that during that period, we were talking about this event in 1996. I don't, because in the Group lit literature has never mentioned about that company's name any further. Do you know where its mines were located or anything about the value of their deposits? I don't know about those, no. Do you know anything about the Lippo Group, whether they own the PT Adaro Mining Company? That I don't know. Um, in your uh, interview with the Justice Department of the FBI, you stated that Mr. Riotti's coal interests were minimal and that Indonesia had significant infrastructure problems that prohibited the development of the country's coal resources. Is yes, I did say that, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll explain to you further why I thought that, because Mr. Mokhtar Riotti Sr., in the early stages, as you mentioned, the, the coal mine they did, they could not even come out to the big ship. So the ship would have to dock in the, the uh, major, the o deep water ocean area they would have to have a, some kind of barge, a small boat, and load it back and forth. That's what I meant. The, the you know, facility was not that well. Are there other companies in Indonesia that are uh, a lot bigger than the Riyadi's coal holdings, than PT Katadin or PT Adaro? I don't know about that. I don't know about um, that. The reason is, is, were you aware that Indonesia is the fourth largest exporter of coal in the world? I'm aware of their large one. I don't know the ranking, though. Yeah. Um, and um, the problem that we're trying to work through here is, is that um, to try to reconcile, yes, they have infrastructure problems, which of course can be fixed over time, mm -hmm. but already they're the fourth largest coal exporter in the world. And in fact, of low sulfur coal, 
that's that's most environmentally uh, what appropriate sensitive they're the second largest holder in the world of this low sulfur coal were you aware of that no, I was not aware that that Indonesia has and, and that's why we're trying to and your testimony is you don't know this uh, but uh, P.T. Katadin and P.T. Adaro are two uh, companies that own, and we're trying to figure out how much of that they own because it's the second largest resources in the world. And the political problem here and what there's been a lot of debate about is, is that the largest resources in the world in Utah were pulled off during this time period. Um, and I would like to at least put into the record some of our concern and then ask uh, a follow-up. And there isn't any real short way to do it. I just would like to sure. put this into the record. And that was... In September 18, 1996, the President unilaterally established a 1.7 million acre uh, Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in southern Utah. Now, uh, we have battled with the appropriate use of whether or not this is appropriate use of National Monument. The area is a beautiful area, but uh, and you could argue either way whether this should be part of our, our National Monument Park uh, wilderness system. And quite frankly, this president has shown a willingness to take almost any park or area and turn it into a, a wilderness area. And furthermore, they had a great picture that ran in front page in color in my home newspaper of Vice President Gore doing the signing with the Grand Canyon in the background, so they got a good political hit. But it appears there was more at work than that, because a 1997 congressional investigation learned that, uh, for example, Kathleen Mc McGinty, in correspondence, the chair of the Council on Environmental Quality, stated, I am increasingly of the view that we should just drop these Utah ideas. These lands are not really endangered because they were under the federal government control. They weren't endangered, so why did they need to be a national monument? Then further investigation revealed that it was to protect the land from coal mining. In fact, at the signing ceremony, the president said that the mining, he, it was to protect this from Dutch coal companies. The mining was conducted by a Dutch coal company, Andelex, and was strictly uh, of the area's vast reserve of clean, burning, low sulfur coal, some of the most environmentally uh, sensitive. Then, um, furthermore, uh, this is what ties in, because he didn't have a traditional national monument justification. Even his own administration and correspondence said they didn't do it. Then he actually went to, at the signing ceremony, and said this is because of the coal. And what, in effect, he did was pull the largest resource of uh, this uh, coal mining off the market, uh, which could have been for a number of reasons, which I granted, but happened to then make the Indonesian holdings, the largest holdings in the world uh, of uh, this low sulfur coal. This happens to coincide is after 2.5 million had gone in from related organizations into the campaign from 92 to 96. Uh, 450,000 was given to Clinton immediately after the creation of the monument. Um, uh, and um, furthermore, on top of that, we had the money that we were talking about earlier that went to Webb Hubble. So it is, it is at least something that many people wonder about because it was such an unusual, extraordinary, and not really defensible position and in the normal course of things of why you did it, although it could have been for campaign reasons. I granted there could be others, but it looks very suspicious. Now, what I would like to know is that at any time in your work with the Lippo Group, did you hear this type of thing discussed? Was this part of the multiplicity of interests? You, earlier you testified that Mr. Riotti had a multiplicity of interests in, in, in getting involved in, in campaigns and in, in trying to get influence with the government. Was coal mining one of those interests? No, that, that subject never came up, sir. Will the gentleman yield to me for 10 seconds? Let me hear what, see what he says. But while they're talking. Okay, I'll yield to you. I, I just want to report uh, to you that in, on July 24th, 1997, according to the Washington Times, certainly a conservative newspaper, uh, it, it said Congress checks Lippo linked to clean coal. And they uh, said after... Uh, receiving hundreds of pages of administration documents turned over to congressional investigators. Uh, the Washington Times uh, said they saw no lipo connection. Thank you for yielding to me. Just want to put that on the record. I'm sorry. Did you have a f no further comments on the earlier question? No, the, the, the coal issue was never, never came up, no. Okay, the... Um, did you have any discussions at any time about the Escalante National Monument? No. 
Were you familiar with that was occurring? No, I don't. Um, when you were a, a representative in Asia for, uh, as I understand the historic record, the Worthen Bank that became part of the LIPO uh, organizations? Uh, the the, the Worthen, and the were, LIPO has some uh, investment interest in the Worthen Bank jointly with the Stevens Inc. And that um, LIPO had interest with, with Stevens. Um, uh, it's hard not to get me diverted into Stevens for a second, but when you, you represent their Asian interests, did that include Indonesia? No, I represent the, uh, for the Worthing Bank as a Far East representative when I was in Hong Kong. Did that include Indonesia? No. Far East, when you say Far, far Eastern in Hong Kong. You know, I was the representative for the Worthing Bank right. for Far East uh, area. And far, by Far Eastern and definition. That's right. That's it would have included in, Indonesia. Indonesia, Hong Kong, China, whatever. And in those Far Eastern interests, at any time, was that related to coal? No. So coal never came up as if any interest in any of the people who were... No, sir. Um, do you know or did you ever hear whether Mr. Hubble, who worked at the Rose Law Firm at that time, and you said he represented some of a lipo interests, whether he ever represented anything to do with the lipo interest in coal? Because as, as Mr. Waxman pointed out, it doesn't, and you said earlier, it doesn't appear there were active coal mining interests at the time of the Escalante uh, decision but that LIPO had interests that were relatively, we don't know whether they were dormant, in other words, they, they couldn't get access to their land and they were just a holding company at this point, or whether they had sold them off, that would be interesting to know. But what we do know is, is that in this earlier period, when you worked uh, with Worth and Bank and when, when Mr. Hubble did, that there were interests in coal. Uh, do you know whether Mr. Hubble had anything to do with those interests? I do not know. Um, so... Uh, this is, this is something that I still find disturbing, but uh, I appreciated your answering those questions because many Americans are tr were trying and still are trying to figure out how all of a sudden we wound up with this huge national monument, much of which is clearly environmentally precious area that would be protected, but a lot of it was pretty marginal. And in fact, we had major U.S. resources pulled off the market and the primary beneficiary is Indonesia and uh, we would still like to figure out how that happened. Whether or not it was Mr. Riotti, it may have been other interests as well. So I thank you for your uh, response. Thank you, Mr. Tony. You'll back. Mr. Pontaret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Juan, I have a, uh, some questions about Pauline Kanchanlak, but before I, I ask those questions, I just want to report to my friend, uh, Mr. Waxman, that during one of the breaks, I. I called my office about Mr. Solomon's 302s, and, and when I told them staff or reception at Rayburn, mid-30s, dark hair, they said if he was also wearing a navy blue suit, they think they know who he is. So, <laughs> I A uh, couple of observations that I would make to uh, uh, about Pauline Kanchanlak. She, she was at, as we already established, the head table at the, uh, the event on February the 19th that we've talked a lot about. I, I want to focus on another date, uh, June the 18th, 1996. Uh, a coffee, um, one of the uh, the infamous coffees uh, at the White House. Uh, and Pauline Kanchanlak was, in fact, uh, involved with the coffee on June the 18th, 1996, at the White House, was she not? That's correct, sir. Okay. And, and did you arrange and work with her on, on the 18th of June for, in preparation for that coffee fundraising event? I did work with her, yes. Uh, exhibit 441, if you could uh, if flip in your programs to 441, is a, a document, a briefing paper uh, for the President of the United States prepared by, uh, I, I suppose, the Democratic National Committee. It's dated June the 6th, 1996. And I would ask if you helped prepare this briefing paper in, as a part of your role at the Democratic National Committee. It's 441, sir, you're talking it, about? Exhibit 441, right. Oh, okay. I, I think I have the number right. <laughs> Yes, I'm, I'm looking at it right That's now. That's fine. I, yeah. Take your time. Did, did, did you help prepare that document? No. Okay. Do, do you know who did prepare it? Excuse me, Congress. Let me try that. Are you talking about Exhibit 4, 441, the following page of 441, the chart, right? The chart, 
Yeah, I did not prepare for that. Okay, the, d the document 441, regardless of who prepared it, projects that the coffee to be held on June the 18th, 1996, would bring in an estimated $400,000. Do you see that? That's correct. Okay. Do you know how that uh, projected figure was determined? This is not the first coffee event that DNC had. DNC had quite a few, I shouldn't say many, quite a few coffees previously. Right. Essentially, through those events, they were trying to inspire some people to come in and have a chance to meet with the chief executive of the country or right. vice president, and hopefully we can inspire these people to later on to make contribution. But generally, for those kind of events, they would target the target uh, hopefully, after the, after all these these coffee, they can raise approximately uh, five hundred thousand dollars. Okay, but but in particular, when they were talking about this, and I understand the purpose behind the coffees, but somebody said, you know, like any fundraising event, you say we hope to raise a thousand dollars of this thing or five thousand. Somebody thought that you could raise four hundred thousand dollars of the June eighteenth coffee, or that four hundred thousand dollars could be realized for the campaign as a result of contacts made at the coffee. I, I'm asking you how that figure was determined. Do you know? Yes, I do. And then why don't you tell us? This is uh, Ms. Kanchanala. Uh, she would like to have two a coffee. She said she would like to, you know, uh, raise this this amount of money. Okay. And, and, and so that figure came from Pauline Kanchanala. Yeah, it is to her idea. She wanted to do one coffee, and then she, somehow she knew about so-called prevailing roughly in doing coffees, how much she was willing to, to raise that kind of money. Okay. And, and as, a, as we already established as a result of her uh, attendance at the, the event in February, you, were, you had a misimpression as to her immigration status or her citizen status at this period of time, right? In fact, that, that impression was way early, in, back in 1992, uh, when first time when I met with her. Today, as we sit here in, in Washington, you know that in 1996 she was not uh, a, a citizen of the United States. Nor, that's that's nor, correct. Nor a green card that is correct. recipient. Now, Richard Sullivan uh, has already testified. He testified that originally at this coffee, uh, there were only uh, eight invitees that, that were to be in attendance, or eight people to be in attendance at this coffee on June the 18th. President Clinton, yourself, Donald Fowler, who was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, Marvin Rosen, who was the finance chairman, uh, Pauline Kinchanilak, uh, and then three additional uh, individuals, Kuhn da Danin, uh, Kuhn Sumet, uh, and Kuhn Saracen, uh, I believe. Is, is that fit with your recollection? Is that true? That is correct. That was the original, uh, that's a pretty small group. That was the original group that was to be present. Um, that was not original group to be present. That was? Was not. Okay. Uh, who else, who was, else was going to come? Apparently when we plan of the, this kind of event, we're supposed to have a target potential guest list being presented. So originally, I think a few weeks, maybe a couple of weeks earlier, maybe even three weeks earlier, there was an, a list I requested Pauline to come up. She, I believe she fasted me. That list of the name was uh, is different from the final ends of the list of who, uh, who actually attended that uh, coffee event. Right. M more people eventually attended than I just read to you. But my question was, it, it's Mr. Sullivan testified that, uh, and, and we're going to get into why more people eventually showed up, but it was his recollection that this was the group that was originally going to be there, and then some people had some questions and concerns about it when they said, yikes, uh, other than DNC officials, there isn't a United States citizen in the batch. Uh, and so is, is, I'm asking you if that's true or not. Is Mr. Sullivan's recollection correct based upon your own? He did not really express that to me. Now I'm going to go back to the original list, why I'm saying the original list is important. The original list was involving quite a lot of American businessmen. Okay. Now, Ms. Cancella was also involving U.S. Thai Business Council, so we have a lot of members coming from the American side. Apparently she had the intention to invite some of those members to, on the American side to attend. But as the, as the event got near and the, the lists were coming down to 
some of the guests you just mentioned, I, the Thai name is again, it's very long, I could not even pronounce them right this time, okay. and plus a few more people. Well, again, going to Mr. Sullivan, and, and for the record, who, who was Richard Sullivan? It was just the uh, fi director of finance in the, in the, uh, the DNC. Okay. According to Mr. Sullivan's uh, deposition that he, he delivered over to the, the Senate, uh, he stated that he grew concerned that the Kanchanalak coffee, and apparently, was it ever known as the Kanchanalak coffee, this June 18th event? I mean, did people start calling it the Kanchanalak coffee as opposed to the coffee at the White House? Hi, uh, this is the first time I heard that they could call Kanchanalak coffee. Yeah. Okay. Well, he, he indicated in his deposition that he was concerned. He grew concerned that Kanchanalak intended only to invite her foreign cli clients to the June 18th coffee. Did anyone mention that concern to you? I don't recall that. No. Okay. He also indicated to you that he expressed concern to you, this is Mr. Sullivan talking again, about Kanchanalak using the coffee for an improper purpose by inviting only foreign businessmen. Do you recall Mr. Sullivan telling you that? I do not recall that, no, okay. uh, sir. Is it true, based upon your remembrance of this particular fundraising event, that Ken Chanelak was, in fact, using the coffee for an improper purpose? At the time, no. You believe so today, based upon what you know today? Or are you, what are you telling me? At the time, you didn't think so, but I maybe did, you do now? At the time, did not think so. How, how do you feel about it today? The reason is she was not uh, eligible to give, so that's not proper already. Mr. Sullivan testified also, and I, I want to read you a, a part of his deposition. When John came up with a preliminary list of who she was going to bring, it included the list was her and the three, the three people from Thailand. I said, John, that's not, I recall saying, John, that's not what we're looking for. I don't want to get, I said, I would prefer you know, I was thinking she was bringing in some people, fellow people that she would be working with in fundraising, some people that might be potential donors, American citizens. We wanted potential donors and to tell her to at least get some more American citizens, more potential donors, more people who are of greater use to us down the road. Did he say that to you? If he did say that, I could not recall then. Okay. Mr. Sullivan indicated that not only did he say that to you, but you said that the coffee was very, very important to Pauline Kanchanalak and that you and Kanchanalak were adamant about having the coffee uh, and insisted that the CP group business persons be permitted to attend. Is this true? Part of the statement, what you're saying, the point you raised, so I did say it is important to Pauline. And Pauline did indicate to me that this, this is going to be very important to her. But culture-wise, I would not really, you know, go for the, the in the uh, confrontational basis to anybody on that, especially Pauline, you know, has the records at that time, didn't you, uh, you know, keep, was giving a lot of money in the past before. Well, and then that, that goes to the next point. Again, Mr. Sullivan's deposition indicated that it's the, the only time he could recall that you expressed some emotion about a particular event. And, and according to him, you said something to the effect of, you know, you know, Richard, Pauline has been a big contributor, a big supporter. It goes back to Vic Razor and Ron Brown, and she's very high maintenance. She has been good to us, and she is making, she is going to be good to us and help us in the fall. This is important to her, and I feel strongly about it. Does that pretty much fit with what you were just saying? It may telling? not be the exact language, but the meaning probably is that I, I did indicate the importance of Pauline. Now, I'd like to supplement to the committee is, Pauline has been quoted by the DNC, other members of the Finance Committee to come up more money without much success. And Pauline told me personally, he said, these people always want to get money and I don't get any benefit on that. So that, therefore, that's how I was approached to say, John, I want to work this with you on that basis. This is how it happened. 
that's why I was sort of advocate certain points uh, on her behalf. You want to go there? All right. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Norton, it's nice to have you here, and you have five minutes and probably more if you'd ask for it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wong. Um, in the press there, um, <clears throat> there have been indications uh, made in the press about whether you had any agreement uh, with people to violate or circumvent campaign rules and regulations. Uh, I'm not sure I have seen that in your previous statements. The, uh, so let me ask you uh, uh, straightforwardly, did you in fact have any conversation or meeting with Mr. Riotti where the two of you discussed uh, violating or circumventing campaign rules and regulations? Congressman, just a second, please. Congresswoman, there was no specific discussion in that kind of language to say we're going to violate the rules on that. Or circumvent the rules? Or circumvent the rules. Um, would the gentlelady yield just for the benefit of the gentleman, not, not to, to interrupt you, but uh, given your testimony to, to, so far, I'm just wondering if you want to reconsider your answer. Um, this, do you want a time to just t talk to your counsel on this issue? I just think it might give the wrong impression. Uh, if I could clarify my own uh, question, uh, it, and because much of much of what we believe we know about this matter comes from the press, about, and, and I'm specifically concerned about whether you had any agreement with people to violate or circumvent campaign rules or regulations, as the press has implied. Uh, I have looked at. Mr. Wong's prior statements, and I have not found that, and I want to know whether I have missed it or whether there was indeed any conversation or any meeting where there was a discussion of circumventing campaign rules and regulations. You have been, 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 been admonished to be careful. Uh, I'm looking to see whether there's been, there was any such agreement between the two of you. Congresswoman, can I I, 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 let, let me let me make sure you understand. Uh, you know, I am aware of what you have pleaded to. I'm aware of your actions. We are trying to ascertain the extent to which Mr. Riotti was involved in an agreement to circumvent campaign rules and regulations. To answer the question, the Congresswoman, I plead guilty to agreeing to uh, violating the rules, and also I can't do it 
you know, it's about 800 some thousand dollars, maybe around that figures. But there was never ex explicit use of the terms of what you have mentioned, you know. Uh, if one looks at the te Senate testimony from July 1997, uh, a former Lippo Bank official testified that the Lippo Bank did not receive any benefits, either financially or in the form of regulatory assistance. Um, now, when you made political contributions, did you do so with the intention that the Lippo Bank or any other Lippo entity would receive favors or benefits as a result? Congresswoman, the, the contribution would benefit Lippo Group in general, since Lippo Bank California is one of the units of the Lippo Group. Certainly, you know, I would not really rule out Lippo Bank will get some sort of benefit. But I, I don't know. I can't specifically mention anything at this point. You know what the bank was benefited right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let, let me just take a couple qu minutes here for some questions. Uh, you uh, told us uh, mm -hmm. that you identified an additional 700000 or $800,000 in illegal contributions to the Justice Department between 1992 and I think you said it was an additional, it was in addition to the 156 that you pled to, yes. seven to $800,000, is that, that is correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. Yeah. Do you include in that total the $450,000 that James and Eileen Riotti uh, gave to state parties in 1992? That is not. So in addition to seven to $800,000, there's another $450,000 that they gave to state parties? That, that's correct, yes. Uh, those were illegal contributions as well. Uh, at the time, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Re James Reality had the legal status in the United States, has a PR and green card, and so was uh, Eileen Riotti at that time. It's my information that uh, Mr. Riotti had not been a permanent resident of the United States for a couple of years in 1992, he had abandoned his residence. He was not. He was outside the country for at least two years, or about two years. The only thing I can report to Mr. Chairman is the knowledge I I, I know is that Mr. Riotti at 1992 he had a green card with him. Was he living in the United States? He had a residence in. The was he living in the United States? According to the information we have, he had been living in Indonesia for about two years. Oh, had, no. um, had abandoned his residence by 1992 and was not living in the United States. What? Do you... I mean, you were working for him. You must have known where he lived. He wasn't living in the U.S. He, he was traveling back and forth. He, when he was in the United States, he did use his residence, though. That's the only thing I can 
<laughs> answer to you. He, Where was his family? His, his family was traveling with him, was with him. So everybody lived on an airplane. They lived in both places. No, it's, it's not. You Where know. did he spend most of his time? Okay, that is a very good question. At that period of time, he spent more time in Indonesia. So he was his, he, he was living in Indonesia, but when he came here, he would stay in a residence here. That is correct. But okay. he also had a green card with him. At that I think time. we're splitting hairs here. I'm the the sorry, fact is, I he was not a permanent resident of the United States. <clears throat> did the Justice Department tell you? that they consider this $450,000 in contributions he made to the state parties illegal? Mr. Chairman, uh, to answer your question, they did ask about it, you know, and we also explained to them. I didn't believe they, they expressed an opinion on it. They didn't express an opinion about whether or not it was illegal or not for him to give that That's money right. to Steve. Earlier, you said that uh, James Riotti could not make contributions when you were at the DNC because he had abandoned his permanent residence. Is that right? Here in the United States. You said... I, I did not ask him. He did not have a legal status, so... No, there's no did he point. Still, did he still have that place he visited and stayed at and when he came to the United States? I think the residence still maintained, on, yes. So he me. still had the residence, right. just like he did when he back in 1990, 91, and so forth, when he flew back and forth. But now, which you're at the DNC, you're saying he didn't have legal status. He did not have a green card. With what, him. He gave his green card back? I believe so. Oh, I see. So that's the difference. He gave his green card back. But that, that's what the I, fact is he's lived as a permanent resident since about 1990 in Indonesia. He's just traveled back and forth. That's correct. Hmm. So the $450,000 that he gave to state parties was given when he had a green card, but he was living in Indonesia. Most of the time, yes. Yeah. I want to go into... Uh, <clears throat> a number of questions, but uh, I think what I'll do now is uh, yield to uh, Mr. Shays uh, because I want to get into uh, the Shilai Temple and the contributions that took place. And that's going to be quite lengthy, so I'll go to Mr. Shays now. Mr. Wong, I just want to clarify something I didn't think we needed to go over, but I want to be somewhat specific. I mean, the sense I had with you without going into every bloody detail was that uh, you had decided to find a way to have Mr. Riotti carry out on his million dollar contribution effort to, to the president. So now I want to ask you some specific questions because my view to the questions I asked was I said this was a team effort and you said yes. Uh, did you inform James Riotti of every contribution made on behalf of the Lippo Group? During 1992, uh, three and four, yeah. I'm trying to answer the 1992. For instance, the various Lippo executive who made a contribution, or I solicited from them to give the check to me. I did had occasion to mention to him, say each and every individual who. How did you do this? Uh, through phone. Did you provide Mr. Reality with precise information on each contributor? Yes, I did. Did you tell the Justice Department that James Riotti had enough time to write down all of the information on each contribution? Yes, I did. Did Mr. Riotti record all the information you gave him? As far as I understand, but she was, he was on the other side of the phone line. I did not see him. Does this apply to all LIPO-related contributions in 92, 93, and 94? Basically, you're correct on that, sir. So the bottom line is uh, both of you uh, were working together to find a way to have him carry out this pledge, and you worked hand in hand in this effort. That's true, isn't it? Yes, he was aware of what I was doing, yes. And he had to implement what you were doing. He had to make sure those individuals were reimbursed. Isn't that correct? To a firmly answer to some of the people I know, they they were reimbursed. 
But some of the people I did not know, but I have no, assumed no. they are. You, you assumed they were, yes, and right. that was the base. Okay, I, I thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, <clears throat> let me uh, uh, ask a couple of questions here, uh, unless uh, did, are you ready for more questioning, uh, Mr. Satter? Mr. Chairman, uh, you, you indicated you had questions that were going to be somewhat lengthy on the Shilai Temple. Yes, I think I'll defer on those till tomorrow. Well, I, I was going to suggest that, that, that if you could ask those questions now, we could get those questions on the record. Uh, Mr. Wong's been here, I think it's been 11 hours maybe 12 by the time you're finished with those Shilai questions. And um, I, I think he's answered almost everything that anybody could think to ask him, but I'm sure there are other questions. Uh -huh. Maybe we could then uh, submit questions in writing to have him respond for the record. He did say he's testifying next week again in no. Los Angeles on this matter. No. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, we, we have waited three years for Mr. Wong, and we're going to complete the questioning tomorrow or Saturday. We're going to try to get it all done. The, we need these questions answered as thoroughly as possible for the record, and then after we get these answered for the record, we're going to go over them with a fine-tooth comb and check them against other things. So we don't want to do it in writing. We want to do it in a very thorough and meticulous way. So we're going to proceed. Uh, let me take five minutes now, unless there's objection. Mr. Wong, uh, we were talking about your severance package some time ago. Uh, did that cover all your political contributions for you and your wife in 1994? I believe you said yes. I did say that. Yes. Okay. And uh, how did how, how did it how much did it cost you to maintain your two homes in California? Uh, it varies because I had a various the mortgage rates, variable mortgage rates. I know, but give me a rough idea each year how much you had to pay to maintain those homes in California. It's probably anywhere from monthly, probably eight to $10,000. Well, the records we have say, it says it, you said it cost $137,000 per year to maintain the homes. Is that about right? Including all the maintenance and expenses, probably that's correct. 137000 yes. yeah. Now, your salary was $127,000 a year. Uh, how did you do that? Uh, to answer the question, you had to give me a little time to give you some background on this. Well, if you if allow me to do that. Yes, and 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 uh, okay, go ahead. Okay. The two houses, actually, I had a chance to own in the concurrent time, did not start it until 19. The latter part of 1989 mm -hmm. and forwards till till last year. Uh, to understand that, we had to go back to how I got involved in those two houses in the first place. Um, as I reported to the committee, I was working in Hong Kong between '83. And actually, my family stayed all the way through '87. Although on 80, at the end of '86, I was working. In, in the United States. Uh, being number one, being the United States for all these years, I really appreciate the, the countries offering me the opportunities. I got married and I work and, and also had to save some money and also invest money in the stock market. Have a little savings there before I went to Hong Kong. Now, the, the law allow, if I understand correctly, when people working overseas, the income up to say seventy or seventy-five thousand dollars will be totally tax exempt. So I enjoy that kind of benefit. Being working in the as an expat during that period of time, virtually the rent for the apartment in Hong Kong was paid by the corporate entity, and the school expenses for the children is also being paid by the corporate entity, and also there's a car involved. And uh, even that, my wife and I did not really chose to hire a maid who were working for ourselves. So basically, in that period of time, the, most of the income was captured 
as a saving basis. Did not really go to a lot of expenses like most of the time, like what we are living in the United States, you had to pay a lot of things. So how much did you save during that? Now the, the loosely you can seventy seventy five thousand dollars is very easily that amount of a save during that period of time probably go over two hundred some thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Now in eighty seven when I uh, brought my family back here, that was the tail end of the California of the real estate boom. We have a congressman here in this committee in California, probably can testify that as well. I took the opportunity to take some risk at that time. For instance, the first home we got was in Cerrito in 1987. I believe I put in something like 70 or maybe even 90,000 as a down, and I borrowed money for the remaining for the house of $393,000 plus some closing cost expenses. That's a small, relatively. And in the meantime, we found out the Cerritos area we lived, although very nice, but I was working basically in Chinatown, downtown Los Angeles. In the commuting time, was quite horrendous. So we were looking for some places a little bit closer to, to what I was working at at that time. So, but we had to have a place to live, so we light Cerrito, the environment was good, so we bought a home. So in the same times, I was, my wife and I was using the remaining of those savings, at least part of the savings, to find out the Glendale location. There's a new development over there. We were talking to the sales agents at one time, and next week we went over there, the price was gone up, you know, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000. So we got a message on that. So we took a very big gamble and say, we probably would like to live in Glendale area because from there to downtown, it's only about 15 minutes in driving. Area is very nice, it's in the mountain area. So we used the money to put a contract to construct two homes in the concurrent time. One was the city view, so much better. The other one is with the mountain view because we did not know which one at the end we're gonna live in. So by the time the house was finished, we decided to move, we put our Cerritos home, which I bought at about 393,000 on market, and I sold it with $555,000 in less than one year time. And in the meantime, the two contracts I did put on those two houses in the being constructed in Glendale, the list price, the contract price, one is 595, the other one was 599,000. And finally we decided to sell one of the house, we decided to live in one. And we we'll put that house in the market, I believe we sold in a few months for about 840 some thousand dollars. So through this combination of things, there would be money stashed away for us, in, and I was very fortunate at the time on that. So when you went to the Department of Commerce and you were making around what, Sixty, seventy thousand dollars. How much were you making? Commerce? Oh, in the commerce department, I was making close to one hundred ten, one hundred twenty thousand dollars. One hundred ten thousand dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, I did not really finish what I was trying to say. Well, and I think we have the general idea, but you go ahead if you'd like to finish. Yeah. And I also call the so the the greed of the human nature. I thought this thing is gonna continue moving forward. You know, I sold one house already, I have more money. Suddenly there was a last lot in the, in the development area. So I went, my wife said, we went in to get that one. Well, hopefully by the time we finish that one, we can decide, we want to, that one has larger, it's also city view. We sold the smaller one, city view was 800 some thousand already. So we wanna get into that one. And with the hope by the finish we can sell one of them and we can get more profit on that basis. Then we got caught. And the boom ended. With all the intention we want only one own one house, but at that time we end up with the two houses. Now you go into the, the weakness of human nature. You say, well, next year is going to be better, next year is going to be better. But next year never came for a period of time. Yet, you know, I was traveling, doing all different things. You know, when I got the final homes with the Rimquest one, I was working in New York, was traveling back and forth, never had the time to take care of that. In the meantime, you always have 
hope the best next year is gonna come better. So basically from that time on, I was, all the money I was making <laughs> decides to give it back because you had to carry those two houses. Mm -hmm. uh, as you, you mentioned, you know, it's, it's not really cheap to maintain those two houses. So when you went to the DNC, you were making what, about 60,000 a year? That's correct. You went from 110 down to 60. And you've been maintaining two homes at about $137,000 a year. Now, I, you're, you're, you're living off of the money you made from those previously. Is that what you're saying? This is not true. Uh, part of monies are being used. Maybe you still have a residual money. But the key point is the, the, the help came in for the severance pay. Remember, uh, in 1994, I got from the Lippo Group? Yes. You show me the list. That was about a, a, another 240 or 250 thousand coming in. That gave me the breathing room for the following few years. I see. So that carried on for a few more years until 1996. Because I thought the campaign go to the DNC is only for a short period of time. Afterwards, either I'm going to find another job or going back to the government or whatever it is. Uh -huh. Then my my financial condition will be. Re re Restored will be restored on a normal basis that can carry on on a normal basis, but this things erupt So I was functionally unemployable during you know past three years The crunch time really came in in 1998 and I had to be very truthful to you. I virtually had to borrow money from people and uh, And then we really made a determination and we luckily the real estate market start gradually turning around a little bit. So in 1998, exactly about a year, a month ago, we sold the house and did not lose money. We were able to get all our equity back. And also I sold another investment home, which I was, uh, my wife and I was carrying when we were living in DC area back into the 70s. So one of the rental homes as well we, we were using those kind of money to pay off the debts and pay off my living expenses, uh, uh, legal expenses. That's how, how it become. Okay. Uh, all of the bonuses <clears throat> that you received, the 20000 this year, or the, the money that you got, $20,000 from the Riottis, I guess, this year, in 1999, and 18000 last year, is that correct? Oh, that's not a bonus, it's a gift, as I okay, report yeah. to you. Yes. Did, yeah. did, did you get any other gifts or bonuses like that? During this, uh, this couple of years, sir? Well, in the last several years. I didn't recall there was any, anyone else that's giving money. On, on the bonuses that you received from the Lippo Group, the Riottis, on the cash, you said sometimes you got money in cash from some people, uh, the 18000 and 20000 did did you report all of that on your income taxes? No, that was a gift. It's not a bonus, sir. In other words, the, the gift is to, in other words, we, as far as I learned, you know, I'm entitled to receive gifts of less than $10,000 without having it reporting anything. And you don't pay taxes on that? That is correct. Did you borrow any money from uh, Mr. Riotti? No, I did not borrow from them. Okay. Those 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 gifts for twenty thousand you said and eighteen thousand in different years, sir. In different years, right. and you said if it's under ten thousand, you don't have to report it. I thought it was for two persons, you know, one for my wife and one for. Oh, so ten thousand was for your for wife. For each person, and you know, then nine thousand for each. So the, actually, know. the money went to my wife. It did not come to me. But I'm reporting as I consider my wife as part of me. So I just mentioned to you, sir. See, did you have questions? Mr. Souter? Um, as is always uh, true, when people abuse power higher up and people along the road wind up abusing power too, there's really sad tra family tragedies. I, I think one of the things that touched me most in, in all these hearings uh, was talking one day to Johnny Chung in between some, some meetings and he told how he would go down to the pier in San Diego uh, and always loved to fish there with his son. But after this broke, um, 
he couldn't go there because the media was there and one of the things that he missed most was being able to fish with his son. He also said that all the people who used to welcome him over at the White House and Mrs. Clinton's office and other places, he said, they don't consider me a friend anymore. Uh, those are tough times. It happened in Watergate too when there were tons of people who lost everything they had, some of whom were marginal players, some who were bigger players, and some who really deserved what happened to them. Um, I don't know for sure uh, where all you fall, but I'm sorry for your personal struggles. Well, I thank you for bringing up Ms. Stouter. In fact, my lawyer didn't even know when this so-called treason things came up and my son received a call, somebody called home and says the, the, something that the penalty of a treason is, is a death by hanging. You know, just, just as openly spoke to, to the phone. And my son just told me, you know, very nervously on that basis. And uh, uh, it, it, certain thing it did happen. Uh, if, if I'm allowed to, to make a few points on here, it's more personal things. I never proclaim that life is going to be fair and people are going to pros promise you it's going to be fair. And uh, all life is going to be smooth. If I did not come to work in the government, did not come to work for DNC, and um, probably I'm working for other profession, I will meet other challenges as well. The, 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 the key issue is when we face the challenges, we have to honestly, to the best of ourselves, to face the challenge and, and get it over with. And that will be one event in your life because it's the event is going to last you for life because you have many more years to go your life. Hopefully you can get over it with as quickly as possible. Um, this is the thing I'm, that's the attitude I'm, I'm taking. Certainly I was sorry the, I made a mistake, I created a lot of notoriety, you know, and caused a lot of pain for a lot of people. But I did it, so I'm trying to correct it as, as much as I can on that basis. One of the things that I, that I hope you understand too is, is that it's not always comfortable being in our position and trying to get to this, but there are a number of, of issues that we're at the edges of here. Uh, the most probably significant to the United States of America is, is the fact, for whatever reason, incompetence, uh, sl virtual slobbering over increased trade to, to, to China, uh, and possible uh, decisions that were made inside this administration that may have been influenced by money have potentially lost every nuclear secret we have in this country, and my son and my children could die because of that. So in addition to whatever problems you have and the individuals that get involved in these investigations, in fact, somewhere along the line, all of our families have been put at risk. Furthermore, when decisions are unilaterally made by an administration regarding coal policy, and, and they take other people's assets who invested much money in these companies and, and hope to do that. In addition, there were many people involved who are following the laws and political campaigns, and they try to run campaigns, and that leads to employment for different people, and they may have lost their jobs. There's, there's lots of different stories, but I think I myself am a Christian, and anybody whose heart doesn't go out to you as an individual right. uh, is, is insensitive, uh, but there are uh, larger questions that we need to pursue, uh, right. too. I, I fully agree with you, you know, Congressman. I'm, that's what I'm here, you know, hopefully, and could make a, a satisfactory conclusion afterwards. Well, thank you. I, I now have a, a, another series of, of uh, questions, and um, they relate to what we've referred to a couple times as the Uri Donata uh, contributions. And um, I apologize if I mispronounce it, but I get called at oh. least half the time Souter rather than Souter. Uh, so uh, my name isn't as complicated, but we all do that. But I'll do the best I can. If I make any errors, please forgive me. Um, could you explain how you met them? Uh, I met the, let me call the first name, probably easier, uh, because the last name is very long. Would you ever agree? <laughs> Would that be okay with you? I think the, the man's name is Arif, and the, the wife's name is called Soraya. So it's much shorter, it's so easier. Um, the first time I met with the, uh, the couple was in the, the summer of 1994, not before, not too far away after I joined the Commerce Department. Now, Ms. Uh, Soraya's father is uh, Mr. Hasin Ning, as you know very well already. Apparently, he traveled around the, 
the world very, very regularly. And he, he's got daughters here in Virginia, in addition to, to Soraya. I learned that Soraya is also the daughters coming from different mother from the other two sisters living in this neighborhood. But somehow Mr. Hassini suffered a heart attack. So immediately, immediately we have to send it into the hospital. So out of that kind of concern, and uh, I happened to be here in Washington, and so I was contacted indirectly or directly by Mr. Riotti, indicating whether I could extend some courtesy to visit to uh, Mr. Hashini on that basis. Besides, I met Mr. Hashini during some group kind of meeting back in Indonesia. So in the hospital, that was the first time I met with a couple. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to give the gentleman an additional five minutes uh, to, to pursue his investigation. Without objection. Uh, thank you. Could uh, you should look at exhibit number 210? Um, this is a letter from President Clinton, uh, Clinton to uh, Dr. Ning. Um, did you request that letter? I did not request that letter, but I know of the letter. Yes. Did Mr. Riotti request the letter? Who, do you know who requested the letter? I don't know whether that was uh, Mr. Riotti's suggestion to, let me go straight, straight forward, straight, uh, suggest to Mr. Uh, uh, Mark Middleton, you know, hopefully he might be able to get something like this, you know, to show some gesture to make them feel better on that. So you approached uh, Mr. Middleton. Right. On um, Exhibit 211, there is a letter from Dr. Ning to President Clinton. Um, this is dated September 5th. Do you know how long Dr. Ning took in recovering? I'm not sure he really recovered. He was constantly a little bit better and then went worse, that kind of situation. But he was here for quite a few months. And in the uh, letter it says uh, it thanked the president for Mr. Milton's visit. Um, do you, were you with Mr. Middleton when he visited the hospital? Yes, we did. Um, anyone else with the two of you? No, just Middleton himself and myself. Do you know whether the president requested Mr. Middleton to go, or was it a... Uh, I didn't believe that was the case, though, sir. Um, did you or anyone else make an effort to have Vice President Gore visit the hospital? No. Um, that in Exhibit 212, um, uh, do you know, it's, it's a November 8th, 1995 letter from President Clinton to Dr. Ning sent to Mark Middleton. Middleton. Do you know why it was sent to Mark Middleton? I do not know. This is the first time I've seen this letter. Um, how often did you see uh, uh, Sonia and uh, Saria and Arif? in between the time Dr. Ning fell ill and the November 2nd uh, fundraising event. Did you go see them very often? No, I, I did not, but we met a few times, yes. And occasionally, as Congressman, as I mentioned to you, my home was still in LA. There is a, a large Indonesian community over there as well. Occasionally I brought in, you know, for them, uh, some Indonesian food. And, because the family member was, was here, flew in. I think wives of the Mr. Asini was here. So I did, did that. Did you visit their home before? No, I did not. Uh, did you know what they, uh, their careers were or what their jobs were? Um, you're talking about Arif. Um, I did not know for sure his exact job, but he receive a master's degree from the University of Pennsylvania, and he was planning to set up a business in California. Did they seem very wealthy? Uh, or yes. Kind of more middle class? No, for themselves it's not. You can't really judge from the outside. But I do know deep down in back, back my head, the family is very, very wealthy. Because of um, uh, Saria's parents, or how would you know that? The, the Saria's parents, yes. Um, but you didn't know whether they actually had that money, you just knew she potentially was going to inherit that money? Sort of the, over your life, you sort of develop a certain kind of judgment. Now, the real judgment is correct or not correct, that's another story. But in the impression, 
the family is very well off. The kids also have money. By very well off, do you mean like millionaires or? Oh, definitely in that range, yes. Um, but then why, they were living in a townhouse at the time. Do you know why they would have been living in a townhouse if they were millionaires? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You know, the, the by li where they're living and what kind of car they're driving really sometimes is not, not much bearing to the, the wealth of the persons, though. Because, because this is important because they put a lot of money into the campaign, and the question was, is, was that their money or not their money? And that's kind of where I'm headed with some of my questions. So I'm trying to establish what you knew sure. and what you suspected. Uh, now, they were, uh, are you aware that they, uh, in the, that they uh, the statements that they made in the Senate reports on campaign finance? Yeah. I'm not aware of that, yeah. Um, that they made it clear that you directed all of their political contributions um, and that uh, they, Arif acknowledged that your solicitations began in 1995 when you were still a commerce official. It goes on to state, quote, Arif recounted that Wong solicited November 9th, 1995 contributions in connection with a Washington, D.C. fundraising event. Do you believe those are accurate statements? That is correct, starting from that time. Um, were you aware that they were given a large amount of money in early 1995 by Dr. Ning? By Dr. Ning? Yes. I was not aware of Dr. Ning ever gave money, no. No, the, the, that the uh, weary Donatus were given a large amount of money from Dr. Ning. You were not aware of I was not aware of that. Um, Mr. Chairman, may I have additional time to finish to at least? Without objection. Uh, he, he wants five more minutes. Without objection, so order. Um, that on November 2nd, 1995, the day of uh, Vice President Gore's fundraiser, they opened up a bank account, um, and Dr. Ning wired each of them $250,000 that day for that bank account. Uh, then they wrote their checks to the Democratic National Committee six days later, uh, the day after the wire transfer came in. So, in other words, he wired the, them each 250000 They opened up a bank account on November 7th. The transfer of $250,000 each came in on November 7th. On November 8th, they wrote the f fundraising check. Were you aware that they needed to get the funds to contribute from Mr. Ning? Congressman Salter, I've seen some of these records that you mentioned about, but in my mind, you know, I never had a thought towards the Dr. Ning's money. You know, I always felt that would be, that was their resources. Because what they did wasn't legal. Um, the, um, did you ever speak to Mr. Riotti about their contributions? Ever have any discussions about what the uh, where Donatus were doing? No, excuse me a second.
Congressman, first of all, I did not, did not think that was illegal uh, for their contribution on that. Uh, their coming to me is through the recommendation of Mr. Riotti uh, on that. Um, so after they gave the money, did you ever talk to him about the contributions? Did you ever discuss how they were helping and where the money, not necessarily even where the money came from, but just about the contributions? I believe Mr. Riotti knew about, knew they were, you know, they were making contributions. Certainly I did not report it and say, well, Arif is making the $100,000 contribution today, the next day is 25000 I was not under that kind of situation. I probably should have asked this uh, earlier for the record. Could you explain the relationship between Dr. Ning and Mr. Riotti? They were, no, first of all, Dr. Ning was supposed to be categorized as a Ford of Indonesia, just like our Ford Motor Company here, meaning he's in the automotive business. He's, I think he's probably billionaires in my recollection on that. They have, uh, they have a bank, but they have, I believe they have joint interest in the Lippo Bank, Jakarta. That is to the extent I know for fact. For other interests that I, uh, they might have other in joint interests, in which I, um, I don't know. So at a minimum, they had a, a joint interest in the Lippo, Lippo Bank and that um, uh, Dr. Ning and, and Mr. Riotti were interrelated in, in Lippo. That's correct. Um, the Weirdenatas were not on the list to attend Vice President Gore's fundraiser, yet it appears they did attend. Do you recollect that? They did attend, yes. Um, could you look at Exhibit 207, which is a uh, photograph taken at the event, and that's them in the photograph, correct? Yes, yes. Did you introduce them to the Vice President? I did. I was standing right next to the Vice President, yeah. And you said earlier you contacted them about this event. I... You made the contact to them about... To Arif and uh, Soraya, yes, I did. Yeah. To this event. Right. And uh, you solicited them. Uh, do you know how they... So it was through you that they found out about the event. In, um, in two, exhibits 208 and 209, um, the uh, solicitor of the $15,000 checks is uh, your wife. Is that correct? because you were at the Department of Commerce at this time. Yes, the, the list of my wife's names on it, yes. Did she ever talk to them about attending that event? Uh, no. Were you aware that, she, why, did you, why did she get listed then? Yeah, I, I did not. I did not know, but this, this issue has been discussed so many times over the last few years and with various investigations. Did not know at that time. The DC, DNC contact is Mercer, correct? That, um, yes, it, this says Mercer, yes. Hey, I have a, I, that's all the questions I have on that particular fundraiser. I have questions. Uh, on the coffee fundraiser that'll take some time. So at this point, I'll yield back unless you want me to continue on this. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Uh, I might be recognized for uh, Chair recognizes a ranking member. Mr. Thank Mr. you. I, uh, I haven't asked too many questions today because <laughs> this is an opportunity for people to go into all the issues on campaign finance investigation. Mr. Burton indicated he's been waiting for three years to have you here and he wants to pursue all these things. and and. Uh, I think it's appropriate to pursue it. So I haven't really asked a lot of questions, and, and I thought that Mr. Souter's questions were very pertinent to the investigation. But just sitting here, I, I, I just want to make an observation that's on my mind. Uh, Mr. Souter said we're, I don't want to be critical of him, but he said he's frustrated because the Chinese seem to have all of our nuclear secrets. <laughs> There's just no information at all that links you in any way to the Chinese having nuclear secrets. And I asked you about those questions yesterday, and you've said you have nothing to do with any of that. And I know of no evidence that indicates that. 
what we're looking at are campaign finance violations that involve conduit contributions. Very serious matter, but I hate to say it, not a very unusual kind of practice among Democrats and Republicans. I wish we could put a stop to it and prosecute people who have violated the law as you've now had to own up to um, your violation of the law. That, that bothered me. And the second thing that sort of bothered me, and I just want to say it, is that I don't think it's the business of anybody to go into your real estate transactions and your personal life. I, I just don't see the relevance of that to anything. You, you've been here now almost close to 12 hours of questioning, and Mr. Burton says he still wants to continue on, and I gather we're scheduled tomorrow to ask more questions, and you're going to testify next week in Los Angeles. I, I'm not going to take my full time here. I just want to make these comments and um, express my feeling that I'm, I'm troubled. I'm just troubled to, to have uh, to hear about things that I just don't think have anything to do with anything, whether it, <coughs> your personal financial matters, those are personal. That's why they're called personal financial matters. And if there's any anything else that anybody has to say, about matters that really genuinely concern the committee, then we ought to pursue those. And I think members have generally done that, and you've responded well to those questions. But um, I'm just troubled and wanted to share my feelings about Gentleman, it. Gentlemen, you. Thank you. Sure. Um, I know you say it sincerely, but I just want to say to you that the reason why we are asking questions publicly is that you felt that it should be done publicly rather than by the committee in private, and then we would focus only on those areas that seem the most pertinent. And the reason to check on houses or anything else is to understand the financial circumstances that makes this witness a credible witness or not. Is he vulnerable to gifts? Is he vulnerable to people who then make uh, his testimony more questionable? And that's the purpose of it. But in your letter, you said, as you know, in the past, many members of our committee have expressed concerns about the practice of extensive questioning of witnesses in closed sessions. This is a letter you wrote to Mr. Burton. I share that concern and continue to believe that the committee and the American people will best be served by having Mr. Wong appear at a public hearing with no restrictions the amount of questions he would face. And yet you keep bringing up the number of hours we've been here. We're going to be here tomorrow. The bottom line is we are going to fulfill the request of your letter. We might have had this, this hearing done in a day. If but I, we had the committee be able to do some of the groundwork first. And, yeah, and let so me just uh, Let me just comment because it's on my time. I didn't, I wouldn't want this session to be behind closed doors in a deposition. I don't want uh, Mr. Wong subjected to all the hours that he's had to do, put himself through here to answer questions without the public having a chance to see the kinds of questions that are asked. And that's why I objected to the abuse that I thought has taken place by this committee in these closed door depositions. So uh, we have him here. People can ask him questions, let the public, if they want to watch all this, it's on C-SPAN, it's on the internet, it's all public. And if, uh, but I, I, I don't see the relevancy of Mr. Wong's real estate transactions. And, um, but if people do, they, they have a right to ask uh, ex exactly those points. Uh, I just think that from my observation of having sat here all day and yesterday as well, and I'll be here as long uh, as we uh, go with this uh, event tomorrow, it, it, people have to ask, stick, stick, stick to what's really at issue. And I think most of the members have, and I appreciate that, and that's why I've not interrupted people and get given unanimous consents for additional time for members to pursue, pursue every possible lead that, that uh, might be of some relevancy. But I, I just... I, I just think that there, I just think there's such a thing as government intruding in people's lives, and we're government, and we're sitting up here on the rafters of a committee room looking down at uh, Mr. Wong. That's the way we structure the way Congress works, and I think we have to be mindful of the fact that he is an individual whose, whose personal life ought, ought to be respected unless it has some real clear relevancy, uh, and also. 
even if we're all concerned as we are about China having nuclear secrets, I don't think we ought to look at Mr. Wong and assume that he has something to do with it well, just by looking at Mr. Wong. Will the gentleman yield? I'm going to yield back my time. I'll yield to you, sure. Uh, the, um, uh, because you referred to something I said yeah. uh, earlier, and I want to make it uh, clear. I, I'm uncomfortable first getting into some of the financial questions as well, uh, although whenever you have these kind of investigations, I mean, there was certainly no reluctance, and, and I'm not known as a, a big defender of our former speaker, but I'll tell you, you talk about getting into finances and ripping somebody's personal record apart and then having it basically not be true. It certainly happened. I'm not saying the gentleman from California did, but partly to get to truth, we had to see what kind of documents his firms were doing and got into his personal life and on the loans and so on. That's part of what happens in an investigation, whether it's, it's fair or not. The second thing is, is that I've been very careful in what I've said today regarding uh, Mr. Wong's involvement in China. Uh, because I don't think we're, we're in the process right now of trying to establish what he knew, what he heard at different meetings, uh, and where it, it might have been, because it is clear that Chinese military money got to the United States. We don't know what that accomplished. And, and I just, I think it is important to point out, I am not, I don't believe we're to the point yet, and we may never get to the point because it doesn't sound like he may have had the knowledge, but this is a fact. The Cox report, which was a unanimous report of Republicans and Democrats, has four pages with the picture of Mr. Wong referring to the Lippo Group and other things. It is a, uh, I have not referred to it and others haven't, and quite frankly, uh, we're, you know, not necessarily even rising to that level. We're trying to get the lower building blocks. But it is clear that it does have potential relevance to this, that according to this report, which was unanimous, there were, was classified information that was gone, and that the concern is not so much what Mr. Wong necessarily did, but were others who he worked with, Charlie Tree, uh, Mr. Riotti, and others who may in fact have been conduits uh, with that. And so it isn't just some kind of a, a wild-eyed allegation that I made. I just said as a broad nature, this report, unanimous from both parties, raises that question. I have the highest regard for you, Mr. Sauter, and I think the questions you've been asking are right uh, on target. These are the kinds of questions that this kind of uh, hearing <laughs> ought to go into uh, in terms of the campaign finance issues. Um, and I want to yield back my time to have members continue their inquiry, although I think at some point we ought to let Mr. Wong have a time off, and maybe if we're coming back tomorrow, I would have hoped we would have finished today, we ought to end uh, uh, for the day at some point and uh, in the not too distant uh, time frame so that we can uh, uh, give him a break. It's a humanitarian thing to do and give ourselves a break, too. Mr. Lotterat. Chair recognizes Mr. Lotterat. The gentleman yield. I'd be happy to yield. Yeah, please. I mean, let's just point out, we, we plan to end at 5 at the request of, uh, of your, your request, so we're ending at 5. And I just make a second point. I do have some... Uh, gigantic disappointment that tomorrow, Mr. Wong, I'm going to have to ask you questions on security issues that I would rather have had to ask you privately because I think some of it uh, is unfair to have to ask you publicly. But this is the only uh, way I'm going to do it. And then I take some exception to then having my ranking member suggest that maybe this isn't appropriate. This is campaign finance, and it's the question of security of our country. And you have been linked to it and we should ask you questions about it, and you should answer questions about it, and we should give you every opportunity to respond to them. I suspect that maybe in the end of the day, we'll find our concerns were misplaced. And for you and our country, I hope that's the case. But we're going to get into that tomorrow. And I'm just going to say to you up front, I am sorry that we had to do it publicly, because I would have preferred to ask some of those questions privately, because then I may have determined I didn't need to ask any of them. Will the gentleman yield no, to me? No, I don't have the time, and I yield I'd, back. I'd be, be happy to yield to him, Mr. Look, look the, the fact of the matter is Mr. Wong is, <laughs> is answering these questions, and he would have put, been put to these questions of the same length of time, because that's the intention of this committee, majority of this committee. And uh, if he's going to be subjected to that, it's my view, and we have a disagreement. Let's, see, let's let the American people see what kind of questions he's going to be subjected to, and let members sit here. You know. 
I showed up at all, some of those depositions. Most members weren't there at those depositions. It was staff attorneys, hour after hour after hour, asking questions. And I pointed this out earlier. In those depositions, the Democrats weren't even allowed to ask any question whatsoever. Our lawyers weren't allowed to ask any questions whatsoever because the Republican majority, which included Mr. Shays, voted to change the rules that used to say there'd be a half hour on one side and a half hour on the other. They changed the rules to say that the Republicans could ask questions for 10 hours, and then if there's time left over, the Democrats could ask. So the rules of the depositions were unfair. Struck me that it's also unfair to subject people to almost a star chamber pr process where no one really knows what's being asked of them. Later, sometime later, depositions are released. But I think it's, I've been very impressed by your forthrightness and your demeanor. And no one would have been able to see that if it had been in a deposition. Most of the people who had been deposed by our committee lawyers never came before a committee for a public hearing. Yet they went, one case, 20 hours. Maybe you're going to match that. 20 hours of questioning. Well, th I want people who are watching this, and I don't know who would watch this long meeting, to think about having the Congress of the United States in a room, bring them in a room and make them answer questions about their real estate transactions <laughs> or their personal lives or their drug use at different times in their lives, uh, 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 looking for something that might be related to an investigation on money that was given improperly. Um, I don't want to minimize the, 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 the business of, of abuse of the campaign laws, but I do think that at some point individual Americans can be abused. Just you're here with two lawyers, you're paying for two lawyers, people who were very minor figures. You were a, a major figure in the, in the, in the conduit schemes at the DNC, at, at, at involving the Democratic Party. I, I've seen people who had almost nothing to do with anything have to sit through five or ten hours of questioning in a closed room, taking time off from work, paying for lawyers, and the public wouldn't even have the ability to know what was going on. So it, but we maybe have a disagreement, obviously we do, but I think there's some value in letting the public see, whatever public may be watching this, uh, the, this kind of proceeding. I, uh, I thank, you, thank both Mr. Waxman and Mr. Shays for their observations on, on why we're here. And I, again, uh, of the 161 people that were deposed, as I said yesterday, it's my understanding none of them were part of a freeway in New Jersey or anything. They're all still with us. So, Mr. Wong, I'd like to go back to asking you questions about I ask you now, Mr. Kassanji, if you can give in a full time to ask questions because you were so I, kind. I thank you very much. Both Mr. Shays and myself. I, I thank you. Without uh, objection. Did gentleman want 10 minutes? Ten minutes would be a wonderful thing if you want to give that to uh, me. I'd ask you to ask Actually, for ten minutes. I think, Mr. Waxman, you've only got, we've only got nine. Is that agreeable? I, I, you know what? I'll take whatever you all want to give me. The gentleman Just, from Ohio is recognized for nine minutes. This is going to be great. Let's move back to something that, some Thank real you. estate that is within the public domain, and that's the White House. And we were talking about a coffee that occurred there on uh, June the 18th, 1996. Uh, and uh, I, I asked you if it was referred to as the Kanchanlak coffee, and you said you never heard it referred to as that. I was looking through some exhibits. It's actually referred to as the John Wong coffee of June the 18th, 1996, in, in DNC documents. And so I guess I'll call it the Wong coffee. We, we were talking about Richard Sullivan uh, from the DNC and, and the fact that he at least indicated to the Senate and expressed some concerns that there weren't any United States citizens on the list coming to this original coffee. And I, I read you some things that he said and asked you for the reactions and things that he said you said. Uh, he, he indicated to, uh, again, to the Senate uh, that uh, Pauline Kanchanilak reacted to his concerns that there weren't any United States citizens coming to this coffee by inviting two U.S. citizens to the coffee, Dr. Carl Jackson and Clark Wallace. Were you involved in the invitation uh, to the, the extending of an invitation to either of those gentlemen? No, th that was totally, as far as I know, it's through Mr. Kanchanilak's initiation. Okay. According to Mr. Wallace, he testified that a day or two before the coffee, you visited uh, Ms. Kanchanilak at her office, and after that meeting, Kanchanilak asked him, uh, Clark Wallace, um, to attend the coffee and told Wallace to inform Carl Jackson, also of the USTBC, that he was invited uh, to attend. Were, were either of these individuals expected to make a contribution at the coffee, the June 18th coffee? 
In my mind, no. Okay. And as a matter of fact, Mr. Sullivan said he was concerned about the propriety, uh, still pro concerned about the propriety of the Ken Janilak Huang coffee, uh, uh, suspecting correctly, as it turned out, that neither Carl Jackson nor Clark Wallace would contribute uh, to the DNC. Uh, Mr. Sullivan further stated that he was so concerned about the, the appearance uh, of this coffee that he invited three additional people uh, to attend, and uh, a Beth Dozer, Dozeretz, Robert Belfer, and Renee Belfer. Were you aware of or, or part of this decision? No. In fact, when the other people show up, Ms. Cancella said, what happened to them? Who invited them? And that was Mr. Sullivan, as it turns out, who I guess yeah. wanted more people that could actually give money to the DNC there. At, at the event itself, uh, according to, uh, to uh, Carl Jackson and Clark Wallace, the, the late invitees to the dance, uh, they indicated that a couple speak, people spoke at the coffee. One of them was Mr. Fowler, the chairman of the DNC, and they remember him saying something to the effect, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here to this coffee on behalf of the Democratic National Committee, and these coffees are important so that the president can maintain contact with people. This is particularly, this is important because it's in a particularly important in an election year, and this is an election year arguably the most important since the one that brought Abraham Lincoln to this house. And it's interesting that Mr. Fowler would invoke the name of Abraham Lincoln, and it might explain why they used his bedroom so many times during the course of the, the campaign season, if they thought that it was a, a, such an important coffee. Uh, how long did the coffee last? I don't know for sure. It's less than one hour. Probably okay. around 40 minutes or so. Yeah, and, right. and, and aside from uh, Mr. Fowler speaking, who else uh, did some speaking that you recall to the assembled group? I certainly, I don't recall. I don't know whether uh, Mr. Rosen spoke or not. He was there. And did, the you, rest, did you speak? I did not. You did not? There was no place for me to speak in that kind of... Okay. I, I, um, I, again, going to Mr. Jackson and Mr. Wallace, they recall, and I'll, I'll ask you about it, this either in my remaining time today or maybe we can pick it up tomorrow, uh, but they, they recall that you did make some observations about how expensive elections were in front of the assembled group. Do you, you recall that at all? I was aware of the, the testimony from Mr. Carl Jackson. I was not aware of it. You know, I, 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 I disagree. Okay, disagree that's, with what he said. That's fine. I want to turn your attention to Exhibit 442, and maybe this is where we can, I can stop today if I can cram this in. Uh, exhibit 442 is six pages of notes that, taken from your diary that appear to have been taken at the coffee on June the 18th. The second page of the exhibit has the following notes. China needs U.S. high-tech auto telecommunications. U.S. should be there. Uh, are, the, are those, first of all, your notes from your diary? And if so, uh, what were those notes made in reference to, sir? These, first of all, uh, Congressman, these were my notes. It was my handwriting. Basically, notes of, uh, Look at that. Yeah, I, I know the notes. The, more as a jackdown notes to the guest of uh, Ms. Cantanella was making some, some points, so I took down those notes. Okay, so, so you believe that those notes were made uh, simultaneous or contemporaneous to observations that Ms. Cantanella was making at the coffee? Not her, uh, her guests. Her guests, the, yeah. the foreign nationals that I indicated to you yeah, earlier. The, the head of a CP group. Who were uh, Taiwanese citizens, uh, excuse the, me, the uh, Thai, Thailand, long, Thai citizens. Thai they, very long time names. I just skip on my mind right now. But uh, he's a very well known person. Uh, Kun, Kun Danin, Kun Sumet, and Kun Saracen. Okay. Th those it's are the three individuals that. Kun Danin made the, the points, but Kun Danin made the points in. I don't know if it's a Thai or not, but it was, uh, was uh, translated by, by the, the other gentleman. Okay. The, the second page also contains a discussion of the poultry industry, and there are a number of references to the Tyson companies. Uh, were those notes also made in reference to something that Mr. Danin might have, uh, uh, remarks that he might have made at the coffee? Yes, sir. The bottom of the third page and the fourth page contain several mentions of the relationship with Taiwan. There are statements referring to a leadership change and a political change in Taiwan. Were those also notes taken uh, contemporaneous to com observations that Mr. Denin might have been making? I believe so. Okay. Uh, at the bottom of the pages marked uh, COM 204 and 205, 
There are mentions of the World Trade Organization, which had a rather interesting meeting recently in Seattle, uh, and China. Uh, who brought that issue up, and, and if you can recall what was said? Was that also Mr. Dinin? I believe so. And uh, lastly, I guess uh, for today's purposes, it, it, it again, uh, it, that you are aware that the committee, the Congress, the Senate has had testimony from other individuals that you discussed the need for election funds at this coffee. Uh, and I would ask you as my last question of today, are, are you absolutely certain, sir, under oath, under penalty of perjury, that you did not discuss the need for election funds to reelect the President of the United States at this coffee on June the 18th, 1996. During the coffee you're talking about? I'm talking at the coffee in the White House. I did not. I, I thank you and I if would the gentleman you yield briefly, to the chairman. Did you discuss with anybody during, before, or after the coffee, any of the people in attendance, during, before, or after the coffee can't I, I certainly could not recall on that, sir. Well, you were pretty definitive when you said no, you didn't do it at the coffee. The, the but reason now I, but now you're saying you you, you don't recall. The, the reason I. That's not what you're saying. You didn't do it at the coffee. You know, don't let him jam this in. Yeah. You didn't say. It at the coffee. I did not say in the coffee period. Okay, you, but your question is before or after. Did you say it right. before or after the coffee? Did you ask for any money or indicate? I, I have to tell the truth. Yeah, the only time I'm. The reason I'm hesitating a little bit, Mr. Chairman, was the chance during the uh, beginning of the coffee, not beginning of the coffee, before we even went in the White House. Remember, you, we all have to start in the security gate. They have to check it out, how you're going to get in. There might be a, a very small moment. There's a conversation talking about, I may, might have a mention to say, this, the campaigns, you know, touch upon campaign will, will spend a lot of money. It's a very costly campaign. That was the only, only thing you can link off. You can, can have any inkling to touch upon this issue. That was the only time probably I mentioned. But definitely it was not in the, very bluntly stood up on the table and say, we want everybody to give money and then this and so on and so on. No. Mr. Chairman, I, I, is the green light really still on? Because I just want to make one it's, more it's observation. It's still, still on. I, 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 just, I just want to tell you, Mr. Wong, as, as you go from here to tonight, that, that there's a very specific recollection that, that you indicated elections cost money, lots and lots of money, and I'm sure that every person in this room will want to support the re-election of President Clinton. That comes from Carl Jackson, Clark Wallace, and also two other individuals, R. Roderick Porter and John Taylor. And so it, it's not... Uh, you, I, I think the, that either these four gentlemen are sadly, sadly mistaken in what occurred, uh, or, but we do have a big conflict, and I think you need to know about it, between their recollection of that day and your testimony under oath before us today. And uh, with, with that, uh, if there's anything else you'd like to add to it, fine. Otherwise, I'm, I'm done, and I'm happy to be done. Congressman, I'm, when this account came out through news media, I'm, I've been aware of these things. This is probably one of the events, like uh, the other things, the other few events that I've been accused of to say, really deep down in my heart, I did not make any comment in that, in that event, sir. I thank you, sir, for your answer, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. Uh, and the I think we've exhausted this day. I'll see everybody at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. We stand in recess. Lunch. Hello.